Welcome to today's webinar, A Road Running Southward, Following John Muir's Journey Through an Endangered Land, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the U.S. EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The Clearinghouse provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is A Road Running Southward, Following John Muir's Journey Through an Endangered Land. You can also search for event number 9252940. I would like to acknowledge our webinar partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and to protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. And as you may have noticed on the introductory slide, this is our 100th webinar since 2017. And to celebrate that with us today, our speakers Dan Chapman and Paul Wolf. Dan Chapman is a writer, reporter, and lover of the outdoors. He grew up in Washington, D.C. and Tokyo, the son of a newspaper man and an English teacher. He has worked for the Congressional Quarterly, the Winston-Salem Journal, the Charlotte Observer, and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He has reported from Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, and he currently writes about conservation in the South for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He lives in Decatur, Georgia. Paul Wolf is a former city council member serving the city of Tybee Island, Georgia, where he served five terms. Wolf owns a bed and breakfast on Tybee Island and is an avid environmentalist. His goal is to continue to improve Tybee Island's residents' quality of life while protecting natural resources. He has a BA in English from Vanderbilt University. Following their presentation, our presenters will answer as many questions as time permits. And as always, you can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located on the control panel on the right side of your screen. And as usual, for those of you who have been with us before, we're going to have a quick poll to get started. If you are unable to respond to the poll by uh, clicking on it, you may need to exit full screen mode. And again, you can see our options here where you live and work. And I will uh, let you all know that this will be a slightly different format today, uh, less of a PowerPoint presentation. And um, Dan will get into that in a minute as soon as we're done with the poll. So, give you all a few more seconds to respond, and then we will turn it over to Dan. And thank you all for being here today. We're excited to do this for you as always. We'll give you another couple seconds to respond, and then I'll share the responses. So today our uh, panel our, our audience, 34% is in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, 29% in the South, 19% in the West, 16% in the Midwest, and 2% international. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Chapman. Welcome, Dan. I 
and you need to unmute. You need to unmute, Dan. Hello, and thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate that lovely introduction. John Coleman, thanks for all your good work too. The folks at the Maryland Department of Planning, the Smart Growth Network. And thanks also to Jen Hawes with Island Press, my handler for the day. And of course, Paul Wolf, who's gonna be coming on and talking to us a bit about uh, Tidy and all the good work they're doing down there. Um, the introduction largely laid out what we're going to be doing. Um, I am, I am, let me be the first to wish you all a happy birthday on your 100th podcast webinar. I think that's awesome. Um, and as uh, Michael said, it'll be a little bit different. As you can see, we've got some lovely slides here. Uh, PowerPoint ain't my forte. Um, so I would hope that this would be sort of more of an enjoyable conversation, less of a rigorous educational format. So sit back, put your feet up, grab some sweet tea, and uh, I'll try to educate you guys on John Muir and uh, how I think uh, he is relevant to the issues that y'all hold near and dear. Um, <clears throat> let me just, uh, the introduction, uh, Michael did a good job telling y'all who I am. All of that is indeed true. I now live in Decatur outside of Atlanta. Uh, I've been a journalist for 30 years. I, I now work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm fortunate in that I get to write about conservation in the South. I was pleased to see all of the, uh, the folks from the South and the, the Mideast part of the country on this call, but also folks from elsewhere. Hopefully, uh, maybe y'all can learn something. Maybe I can impart a little bit of knowledge about our lovely, um, lovely and very biodiverse region here in the South. Um, it is one of the most, uh, if not the most biodiverse region in the country, um, when it comes to flowers, uh, bugs, fish, mussels, and the like, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a bit. Um, I, first and foremost, I suppose I should uh, give you, you know, where I'm coming from on this book. I, you know, as a reporter, I covered a lot of the issues that are in my book um, over the years, most recently with the Atlanta Journal Constitution, climate change, water resources and availability, coal ash, um, you know, uh, river pollution, utilities, all that sort of stuff. And I was looking for a way to, you know, sort of stitch all these disparate elements together in one sort of cohesive uh, line of thinking and reading. And so one day uh, I was I was just Googling along, I guess, and I discovered that John Muir had actually walked the South. That was to me eye-opening. Uh, it was actually an epiphany for me because obviously I was familiar with, with Muir and his work out West, uh, father of the national parks and all that, but I did not know that he had walked the South. So I immediately ordered his book, which he calls somewhat erroneously, A Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf. Um, and I plotted on a map, the map you see here, um, his route. And it really struck me that a lot of the places that he had visited along the way um, were places that I had reported, been to, reported from. And actually, there, you know, a few of the things had some really pretty serious environmental uh, issues, stuff going on. So I'm like, aha, I, after plotting it on the map, I'm like, well, this would be pretty cool. Next stage was to go and visit these places. I had originally wanted to hike as Muir did the route, but I was quickly disabused of that notion because as I'm sure you all know, the South today is a lot different than it was in 1867. What for him were trails, farm to market roads, today are highways and super highways, and I did not relish the idea of spending three or four or five months walking alongside I-77 or I-285 or any of the other roads. That to me did not seem fun. <coughs> so, excuse me. Instead, what I would do is I would uh, jump in my trusty little Subaru and visit these places and I recreated his route as faithfully as possible. In some cases, I was fortunate that I, would, I could get out and hike for a couple of days, primarily up in the mountains, a bit of the Cumberland Plateau, and down along the coast and near the Gulf. Um, but so mostly I would just go back and forth visiting the, the places, the, the towns, the, the, the communities where 
um, a lot of the environmental issues that I was writing about took place. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I don't think for a lot of you this really comes as news to you, but the South is really just, you know, sort of an amazing uh, ecological, biological, um, climatological place in which to live. I can be up on a bald, for those of you who don't know what those are, those are mountaintops in the Western Carolina mountains, um, over 6,000, 6,500 feet with wonderful views. One morning and by afternoon, I can drive down, you know, 6,000 feet below level, below the mountaintop peaks to the coast and I'll be in the salt marsh. All of that within about four or five hours. And of course, along the way, you come across just some of the most lovely different habitats and ecosystems. Um, and within each of those, obviously, there is just wonderful biodiversity. Uh, a couple of things jump out at me. 90% um, of the birds in this country either live in this region or fly through this region. 90% uh, of the fresh mussels uh, are in our streams. Uh, two thirds of the fish and one of my favorite, most of the salamanders um, called the South Southeast home. So to, that's just to give you an idea of, of, of what we're dealing with here, what we have, and also frankly, what we stand to lose if things continue upon the way in which we're going. Um, also in the book, um, and it, it, it reads, I, I think um, mostly, uh, I, I refer to it as a Southern environmental travelogue. But again, I'm a journalist, so I like to put people in my story. So each, um, a anecdote each chapter I focus on a person or persons who are doing things either for the good or for the bad of the that particular region um, river keepers um, city planners water planners utility executives victims of coal ash um, all sorts of nonprofit folks and um, government officials um, who I don't think get enough credit for the good work they do particularly when it comes to helping to save our environment. Um, so I try to make it a readable sort of folksy. There's probably too many asides where I'm in there, but I try and limit you know, it being about me and focus more on the people. And of course, John Muir, who I intersperse uh, his thoughts, his readings, his uh, visits liberally throughout the book. Uh, who was John Muir? Um, again, I don't want to bore you all if you know, and you probably do know more, as much or more than me. He was a Scotsman. He emigrated to this country in 1849 with his father and a couple of his brothers and sisters. His mother came over later. Um, they were in Scotland. His father was a uh, itinerant preacher who thought that the Church of Scotland was a little bit too liberal for him. So he wanted to come to the New World set up his own uh, church in uh, the hinterlands, in the frontier, as it were, and they ended up in Wisconsin uh, as farmers. Um, it was both an idyllic and a very harsh upbringing for Muir. Um, he, you know, his father put him to work early in the morning, all day long, maybe Sunday morning he'd get off, and then he'd be back in the fields. He was not schooled except at home and what he could um, do himself by borrowing books from friends. Um, his father was very harsh indeed on him, and it was his version of Christianity which uh, molded uh, John's young life. Um, finally, John was able to escape to Madison, the university, where um, his father didn't want him to go, but where he began his studies and really opened up his eyes. Botany was his thing. Um, he would spend many of his free hours just wandering around the countryside there, looking at plants, flowers, what have you, putting them in a plant press, returning to his small room and uh, establishing his plant library at, you know, at still a very young age. Um, he was also a wonderful inventor, a tinkerer. Uh, one of the things that caught the attention of the uh, college officials was that when he was still in Wisconsin, he built a, a self-standing bed which knew to get you out of out of bed right when the the the, the crow cu crow crows and stand you right upright. So that was one of the inventions that he took to Madison that convinced him, hey, this guy's quite the tinkerer inventor. Um, after a couple of years there, this was at the beginning of the Civil War. Um, he said, "This war is not for me." Um, he had seen some of the prisoners which were housed on the campus, 
of the University of Wisconsin. And he said, this is not my fight. So he became a draft dodger and he went up to Canada, um, walking along the way, botanizing along the way um, in time to, uh, um, to land with his brother. I can't remember quite the town. And for the next two year, year and a half, he stayed up there and helped his brother doing work at a broom factory. <clears throat> uh, he had returned to, um, he returned to the States towards the end of the war. And, you know, his, his goal all along was to uh, explore the world. He was a great and impassioned reader of some of the great explorers of the time, including Alexander von Humboldt, who was sort of his idol, who had a great botanist and explorer, who had uh, made his bones down in the Andes of Latin America, South America. And that's where John himself wanted to go to do the same sort of ex exploration and botanizing. Um, so what he did is by, by the time he um, returned to the States, he went to Indianapolis. He was hired, as he typically was, at a factory for his tinkerer's skills, his inventor's skills. And he was putting together um, streamlining operations um, for the factory owner when, uh, while he was working on a belt, the a file jumped from the belt into his right eye and blinded him. He went home to his boarding house and sympathetically, his left eye also went blind. Muir said, this is it. My dreams of becoming a botanist and world explorer are over. He was greatly depressed and thought his life as he knew it was over. He recuperated his eyesight within six weeks later and he said, man, now or never, if I'm going to do this, I better get to a walking. So he uh, quit the job, <clears throat> excuse me, and start, said, if I'm going to get to South America, I think the best way to do that is just to head south. So he uh, hopped a train to uh, Indianapolis, from Indianapolis to the border town of, uh, with Kentucky. And from there, he started his walk on September 1, 1867, from uh, Kentucky through Tennessee, a corner of North Carolina into Georgia. And from Savannah, he jumped on a boat down to Florida and then walked across Florida to the Gulf. Uh, he says it's a thousand mile walk to the Gulf. Who are we to say otherwise? But I kind of measured it. And it's really closer to 900 with maybe a 100 mile ride on a ship between Savannah and, um, and uh, the northeast corner of Florida. John, at the time, he was in his late 20s, uh, bearded and still very religious, still very um, open minded, uh, still very much the, uh, the botanist who wanted to discover the world. He was also, you know, in, in my readings and interviews with folks, I, I, I call him something of a hippie. Uh, he was a draft dodger. He loved poetry. He loved all sorts of flowers and weed, weeds. Um, he was against the dollarizers, the, 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 the men who only cared about money for the sake of money and not for the protection of the natural world. Um, and so he called them Lord Man with great disdain. Um, he had trouble holding a job, and one of my favorite things that showed sort of his carefree character is that he would love in the middle of a, of a storm, a thunderstorm or a windstorm, what have you, he'd climb the tallest tree nearby and to just sway in the wind to see how far the, the limbs would carry him, um, which I think kind of shows that he was also kind of crazy. But, you know, most of the great explorers and writers and inventors are kind of crazy, so John fit uh, well into that uh, into that category. Um, one of the things which uh, is completely contradictory of his sort of hippie character is that John was also a racist. Um, in his writings, especially his early writings, uh, and including A Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf, he um, you know, used all those, the racist tropes of the times and of, of this time too, uh, towards African Americans and particularly Native Americans. Um, for a man who so prized the natural world and the uh, the green environment, uh, the very people who had been living on these lands for centuries that he was opposed to was really um, disheartening, disgusting, and a, truly a blemish on the man's character. Um, that said, um, I, I am not a biographer of Muir. Uh, I, it did give me great pause as to whether I could continue on with the book, um, but I suppose I came down on the side of you know, 
the Muir the man and Muir the, the impact he left on society and the world. And unquestionably, his impact on the natural world, on the environmental movement, on ecology, on glaciology, and all sorts of other fields of study was um, immense, incredible. And so I looked at it, and I preferred to look at it more as John the movement um, as opposed to John the man. <clears throat> Along his route to, um, to Florida, after about 38 days or so, he was tired, his feet hurt, he was broke, he was hungry, and he was just coming down with malaria. He uh, ended up in Savannah, <clears throat> excuse me, and this was again in the throes of reconstruction. And John was, um, you know, he was just uh, gobsmacked by the poverty and the destruction that had been wrought by the North on the South. <clears throat> Without money, he was searching about for a place to sleep, and he ended up at Bonaventure Cemetery. If any of y'all have ever been there, it's a lovely, still to this day, cemetery along the river, not the Savannah River, another river, um, with, you know, the typical moss-covered oak trees and view, views of beautiful marshlands and sea oats and what have you. And so it is there that he slept for five or six nights um, in a, under a sparkleberry bush near the waters. And uh, each day he would traipse the three miles into town to look for money that he was expecting from his brother to be wired there so that he could continue his trek on down to Florida. While he was there, though, whether it was the, the, the hunger in his belly or the burgeoning malaria, John really had some of, life's, some of his life's <clears throat> great epiphanies, um, including <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me, every, char every character, every creature, every being um, has a role to play in nature. Even, quote, the most transmicroscopic creature, unquote, uh, is valuable. And he further with that, he said, if that is the case, then why is man, why are we considered superior to all other beings? Um, why should we sh kill deer for their hides and for their meat? They serve under God's green earth, similar purpose that we do. Um, that was probably one of his, his greatest epiphanies. Another was, and again, this one really resonates today, and I'm sure it resonates with y'all, is that man, as well as creatures, all need green space. We all need nature. We need it for our soul. We need it for our physical enjoyment. We need it just as part of our mental makeup. Um, so that and other uh, issues that he sort of chewed over there while he was swatting away the mosquitoes and uh, wondering whether he'd ever get enough money to buy um, cornbread, um, kind of were beginning to crystallize in his thinking. So I think it is not too far-fetched to say that his, you know, his sort of bedrock moral and ethical and philosophical underpinnings um, really took root in Bonaventure and, and frankly, um, sort of the, the beginnings of the modern environmental movement too also happened along this route, but in particular in uh, Bonaventure Cemetery. Um, after, uh, just to give a sense of what, you know, the South was like then and what the South is like now, again, over the five states that he crossed at the time, um, there were only five million people. Uh, the land was largely untrammeled. The mountains were beautiful, still filled with, with lovely trees, including the chestnut, um, which has since gone extinct, practically, um, and filled full of game. Uh, you know, there were just small towns and farm to market roads and the biodiversity was incredible. I mean, it was really, you know, quite the, uh, the uh, garden of, uh, of beauty and uh, uh, bounty. Uh, all of that, of course, would change in the next, over the next 40, 50 years as the timber barons came along and denuded virtually every uh, hillside in the Carolinas. Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama mountains, and further beyond too. Um, the rivers became polluted, what with factories opening up in the mills, and the uh, smoke from all these factories and whatnot polluted the skies, and all of the animals started disappearing. So now, you know, if you fast forward to today, you know, people ask me, what would John think about today? If you were to plop him down right now in the modern South, 
Uh, first and foremost, you could be like, holy crud. There are today in those same five states, there are 55 million people. Um, the six of the 10 fastest growing states in the country are here in the South. 40% uh, of the country lives here. Um, in Florida, 900 people a day move to the country, move to the state and about 10 acres of development per hour, 10 acres per hour is lost to development in the state of Florida every hour. One of my favorite studies, and um, you know, I hope he might even be on this call here, um, was one called the Piedmont Megalopolis. Uh, it was back in 2014, and it sort of laid out where um, the Piedmont region was going to go uh, if it was to remain this sort of helter-skelter uh, growth of sprawl, what have you. So um, by, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 2014, 7% of the Southeast was covered in concrete. If we were to continue a pace by 2060, 18% of that would be covered in concrete. The map, I think, was the most telling thing of all of this in that uh, basically from the Alabama-Georgia line up through Atlanta, up to South Carolina, and then to Charlotte and over to Raleigh-Durham would be just one long string of concrete and malls and subdivisions and housing divisions and all of that. Um, so, you know, it was just paints a frightening picture of just what the whole region was supposed to look like. And, and frankly, you know, here it is seven, eight years later, and a lot of those predictions seem to be coming true. I live in Atlanta and it's practically wall to wall development between here and the South Carolina border and up to Tennessee, too, and almost over to Alabama. And I know Raleigh, Durham and Charlotte, where I also lived, are experiencing the same levels of growth. Um, one of the things I'll just read you quickly, a little blurb from that report, quote, the loss of green space is the greatest environmental scourge affecting the rural South today. But don't take my word for it. Here's what the witty authors of the Southern Megalopolis report wrote, quote, history suggests humans, in contrast to ants and slime molds, rarely optimize growth, particularly when multiple objectives such as profit, equity, and ecological integrity come into conflict, unquote. That gives you a pretty good idea of what uh, we're dealing here in the South. Um, but th yet, then again, you know, you look at and, and the mountains are covered again in trees. Um, I go up to Western North Carolina all the time. And as far as you can see, it's just wave upon Blue Ridge, wave upon Blue Ridge, wave of, of trees. A lot of that is because these are second, third growth trees and many of those uh, hillsides, most of them, in fact, <clears throat> and the Smokies and the Nantahala and the Pis Pisgah forests are all under public domain and protected by either the uh, Department of Interior or the Department of Agriculture. Um, the deer, uh, black bear, bald eagles, turkeys, um, all have rebounded. Um, and, you know, hunting is alive and well. And um, all of this is, again, credit to a lot of the policies in the state and the federal level to reintroduce these species for recreation, but also for our enjoyment, I would argue. Um, yet, despite all that, and despite that we are, we still remain one of the most biodiverse regions in the country, if not the most, um, we are in serious troubles. Um, for example, the EPA estimates that half of our streams down here are in, quote, poor biological condition. You know, I could, a litany of the, the, the specific cases, the, the Savannah River, um, is a shell of its former self. The top third has been dammed into reservoirs. The bottom third keeps getting uh, gutted and gouged and digged out forever, uh, deeper down, forever larger container ships uh, to run the river. The Chattahoochee River, um, I used to, it was an old saw amongst uh, journalists that, you know, we'd always have jobs. It was job security because the water wars of the, along the Chattahoochee River between Georgia, Alabama, and Florida would never end. They've been fighting over them for 30 years. And finally, it took one, not two Supreme Court rulings to say, hey, uh, Georgia, Atlanta in particular, is not to blame um, for the paucity of water making its way into Florida and into the Gulf. Uh, but again, it's uh, a much compromised river. And, um, and that's, uh, I still think it's, it's worth noting that probably if there are intrepid journalists out there, you can still cut your bones and make your career writing about the Chattahoochee River. Um, again, the, the threatened endangered species, no region really has as many as we do down here. 
Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, there's such a backlog that in the Southeast, 30% of the species um, are proposed for listing, but can't get listed for a variety of reasons, including backlogs, uh, lack of funding and what have you. We have things like coal ash up in Kingston, I go into in the book too. It's just as throughout the South has left a horrible legacy in communities and rivers across the region. Um, our mountains, as well as our coasts, are being loved to death. Uh, a few years back, I was covering a wildfire along the North Carolina and Georgia border. This was back during our last drought of about five or six years ago, um, which was not a bad fire. Um, but then two, three weeks later, there was a horrific fire up near Gatlinburg, um, which because of high winds and super dry, tender conditions, um, just blew up over uh, really one night or two ended up with the deaths of 14 people in Gatlinburg, 2,500 homes were damaged or destroyed. Um, the uh, it, part and parcel of that handmade into to all of the dangers now in some of our more natural and beautiful areas is uh, what's known as WUI, the wildland urban interface, where everybody wants their two acre or five acre lot up against the national forest and we're just parceling up um, private lands, um, so everybody gets a share, increasing um, not only the, the population, in fact, the Western North Carolina region, mountainous region, is due to gain about the equivalent of six Asheville's, that would be 600,000 people over the next 50 years. But also when there are natural disasters like wildfires, it makes the damage just that much worse too. We have been largely fortunate the last decade, uh, six, seven years at least, that we have not um, succumbed to the same sort of damage and destruction that's taking place out west. But um, it'll come back. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, the next time, when usually we have bad droughts down here every decade. So you can expect that that again will happen. And then, you know, the, the overarching existential threat here, climate change, is um, you know, it's it's different, uh, equally as 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 dangerous and foreboding as it is rest of the country and the world. What we have down here, since we have again been fortunate not to have the um, the droughts, but we have hurricanes with greater intensity and just regular storms with greater intensity now, which are largely assumed to be fueled by warmer temperatures, both on land and at uh, at sea. <clears throat> Uh, example being uh, just last year, there was a storm that sat over Nashville, Tennessee for two or three days, dumped 21 inches of rain, something like that, and just astounding amounts of rain, and a, a lot of people died, a lot of destruction. I just read a little while ago that Eastern Kentucky yesterday succumbed to the same sort of, North Carolina's done it. There's, these storms, um, what seemingly are normal storms are just filled with so much moisture and they sit, they just sit on top of communities. And this is a new phenomenon here and linked largely, we believe, to climate change. Um, in addition to just the warmer temperatures and all of the problems that that will cause for um, people, workers, animals, threatened and endangered species, um, it has uh, just it has these unseen, unpre unpredictable, unseen consequences. One of the favorite chapters in my book is I spent the day with a park service a biologist, ecologist <clears throat> named Chris Ulrey, whose job, one of his jobs, is to follow the the fate and the progress of a beautiful yellow flower called spreading avens, and it is found only on north and northwestern facing rock faces above 4,500 feet. To get it to um, survive in these warmer temperatures, it slowly each year climbs further and further up the rock face towards the top of the peaks. It's only found in about 15, 20 different spots in the mountains. What happens when there's nowhere else to go? Um, that's what we'll soon be faced with, uh, as many regions, of course, in the country will be, when there's no room for species, plants, animals, what have you, to escape climate change. Um, and then, you know, we have just the, you know, development run amok. Um, Florida's disappearing. They've got, they're talking about putting in toll roads to nowhere that uh, really are not needed. The springs are polluted. The oyster beds are endangered, all of that. So um, I have been accused by some, my book is being somewhat of a downer because I list a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, problems. 
But I, you know, maybe that's the journalist in me. I'm hoping that by knocking folks upside the head, that action will be taken. And I, I would be remiss if, it, if I did not say that there is wonderful stuff being done. And a lot of it fits within the, the, the smart growth wheelhouse. Um, so I think um, <clears throat> you guys would probably, as you know, if John Muir were around these days, I think you'd find, he'd find y'all as kindred spirits because um, you know the whole notion of green space and managing growth and um, hopefully you know having a more equitable uh, society for everybody were all things that he that he believed in. Um, so you know there are examples throughout. Um, you know although John was not uh, new urbanism was not a thing when he was around there, and frankly he hated cities. You know, he was most happy, you know, out amongst himself with, with the uh, creatures and the flowers and what have you. Um, but, you know, his ideas, his philosophy, his sort of core moral and ethical philosophy of nature and life, I think uh, resonate um, at least with a lot of the, the planners and um, city, county, federal government officials that I deal with. Um, so I think that we have a lot to learn from him um, when it comes to oh, things like parks and greenways and setting aside um, green spaces for all of us just, if not to live amongst, to be able to visit amongst. Um, so in the, uh, some of the things that really come to mind when um, I'm uh, trying to, you know, make Muir relevant to today is that, um, he, um, th there, there are certain projects all across the region, which when I'm writing about them or visiting them, I go, aha, you know, Muir would find this pretty cool. One of them in particular is the, uh, is the Florida Wildlife Corridor, which is a plan to uh, millions of acres in Florida from the southwest up to the center of the state and eventually up to North Florida and the Okefenokee, a wildlife corridor for uh, panthers and bears and flowers to also escape climate change. Um, a wonderful project which is uh, well underway and soon will be even more pronounced as more monies and lands are attached to that. Um, water, they've, uh, water is critical obviously for everybody and everything. I know it's an important issue for um, smart growth folks. Um, various communities, Atlanta in particular I think and you know, for a while we would hammer Atlanta for being the 800 pound gorilla along the Chattahoochee, polluting it and sucking up all the water, but they got religion. Uh, obviously it was, it was uh, law induced, court induced religion. And over the last 15 years, they were Atlanta, the city of and the region have reduced water consumption by 10%, um, which is a pretty significant amount more to be done. But everything from low flow, flow toilets to fixing leaks in the system, uh, even down in Southwest Georgia, um, big cotton and uh, um, peanut country, some farmers are starting to use moisture sen sensors within their croplands um, to tell via iPhone how much water is there, how moist it is, and perhaps maybe their watering systems should not turn on that day. They can save the water. Um, one of the things which is really in the South, you cannot do conservation and I'm sure that I'm preaching sort of the choir here, without uh, the private sector. Um, you know, 97% of the lands outside of Florida are owned by timber companies, utilities, the private sector, families. Um, so if we are to do any meaningful conversation, we need to work with them. There is an example of just such a thing, a real estate investment trust operating, in this case, along the Alabama-Florida line, is with a lot of federal monies and some state monies and NGO monies has decided that the, um, the loblolly pine, which is their big dollar tree, plantation pine tree, they're gonna replace 200,000 acres with longleaf pine, uh, which is a long-term hardy tree loved by, um, by Eastern indigo snakes and gopher tortoises and the environment in general. So that is an encouraging trend for our forests down here. Um, and then one, one other example I'd like to give is uh, utilities. Um, there's a wonderful example, and again, related to water, of a, a utility down near Charleston, which is investing in 
preserving, conserving the headlands of streams that feed into the Savannah River from which they get their water. So by putting monies into land protection and conservation upstream, the water that goes into the Savannah and eventually to their pipes is cleaner, therefore cheaper for them to clean and uh, fewer chemicals, but really sort of a smart and, and, and helps all around the environment and um, you know, all of the animals and people who love to hike in those woods. Um, and then climate change, uh, there's so much going on. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Paul in a sec um, to talk about all the good work that's going on on Tybee. Um, and what's interesting, and, I, and Paul and I will touch on this too, is just how you know, in the deep red, very conservative South, that there is a lot where climate change in many quarters can be considered a four letter word. There is a lot of good going on. Um, and I will, to set up um, talking with Paul, Paul Wolf, uh, let me just read you a little blurb on um, how uh, he and I, uh, I've known Paul for 15 years. He's a great guy and a wonderful source and everything. And he always keeps me on my toes. So let me just tell you how um, one of the last times that he and I got together, it was on Tybee Island. Paul Wolf leans over the railing and yells down at me, Chapman, he bellows, what are you driving? A Subaru, I say sheepishly. You should be driving a Prius or a Leaf or some other alternative, not an FU, SUV, he scoffs. I mumble something about my kids and good gas mileage and that not really being an SUV. No good. Not even my Grateful Dead bumper sticker modifies Paul, the apostle of climate weirding, who preaches the gospel of a warming world. I pass the jumble of old bikes, kayaks, and other beachy paraphernalia crammed into his open air garage and climb to the third floor area amid the treetops. A placard in the side yard certifies the property as wildlife habitat. I let myself in. The smell of four cats hits me before I see Paul's smiling face. He offers me a beer. I decline. I want to take a bike ride. Paul is one of Georgia's, Georgia's coast's leading environmentalists, a former Tybee Island City Councilman who dragged the hippie redneck outpost into the vanguard of climate change activism. I've interviewed him many times over the last 15 years and learned boatloads. On an island full of characters known affectionately one time or another as the truck stop by the sea or Mayberry on LSD, Paul stands out. Everybody knows him, and not solely because of his shoulder length electric white hair with matching beard that lends itself to prophetic comparisons. That long legged dude cruising on the island on a low ride dino roadster beach bike, that's Paul. So, with that, and with no further ado, I introduce Paul Wolf. Paul, take it away. You need to unmute, Paul. There, there you go. go. As, as Dan mentioned, I am a recovering politician. Uh, I'm going to give you a rough overview of some of the stuff I managed to accomplish as a small town city councilman, and I'll be glad to add details during the Q&A. Tybee is one of 14 barrier islands along the Georgia coast, one of only four that's accessible by car. Our economy is primarily tourism and associated businesses. The island is 2.6 square miles with 3,000 full-time residents. But on summer weekends, we'll have 40,000 people, most of them spread out over four miles of beach. The high ground is pretty much maxed out with fewer than 100 undeveloped lots. And our infrastructure is taxed by traffic, trash, and a water withdrawal limit dictated by the state. <clears throat> Development has increased the percentage of impervious surface requiring creative stormwater management. If you look beneath the surface, Tybee is really nothing more than a glorified sandbar held together by sea oats and tree roots. We live in a very fragile, finite environment, and everything is at risk due to the effects of climate change. We hadn't been hit by a major hurricane since, since 1898, then got slammed by Matthew and Irma within a year of each other during the second decade of this century. And that's likely to be the new normal. This picture wasn't even during a hurricane. This is a spring tide and spring doesn't refer to the season, rather uh, it's the phase of moon, either new moon or full moon cause spring tides, which are the highest we have. Our normal tidal range is six to eight feet above sea level. This was a 10.2 foot high tide with winds that blew the water over Highway 80, the only road on and off the island. This is a US highway underwater and it's the only way we have to get there. We're on the front lines of sea level rise. And when I was elected in 2003, 
My primary goal was to build a sustainable, resilient community doing everything we could to, resu to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote alternative transportation, and transition away from fossil fuels toward renewable energy generation. We started the first curbside recycling program on the Georgia coast in 2004, and it was a steep learning curve for a lot of people. Manufacturing with recycled content uses a fraction of the energy and creates far less pollution and environmental degradation than, than um, extracting and processing virgin materials. I worked with the Department of Community Affairs to develop a marketing program to increase awareness of, uh, and promote recycling among the 19 to 34 year old demographic, which is least likely to recycle, but most likely to respond to peer pressure. When the marketing firm came up with this campaign, I said, I really didn't like the whole reverse psychology approach. And they said essentially, well, that's because you don't get it. You're not in the demographic, you old fart. So um, turns out they were right. When you go to the yougottabekidding.org website, it contains four fictional characters in the demographic with, with these idiotic reasons why they don't recycle. And then there's a very active blog with people saying stuff like, well, here you dumbass, here's why you really need to do it. I was a charter member of the Savannah chapter of the Green Building Council, even though I was eminently unqualified. They let me in because as an elected official, I could help with regulations encouraging more sustainable development. On Tybee, we increased building setbacks and required that they be kept as perpetual green space. And I had to explain to a few folks that AstroTurf doesn't qualify as green space. New driveways have to be permeable, which helps reduce stormwater runoff. We enforce a 25-foot buffer adjacent to Tidal Marsh to protect one of our most valuable resources. Georgia has a third of the Tidal Marsh on the entire eastern seaboard, and studies have shown that one acre of undeveloped marsh provides $20,000 a year in ecosystem services, including sequestering tons of carbon. We localized and beefed up the state shore protection ordinance, allowing no land disturbance within 10 feet of the landward toe of the landmost dunes. When we ran into some flooding issues because water was blocked by healthy developing dune fields, we got permission from DNR to do interdune discharge of stormwater that used to flow directly into the ocean. We bored through the landward dunes and ran perforated sewer pipes between them and the next row parallel to the beach. So instead of going to the, into the ocean, now the water percolates straight down. To further reduce pollutants coming off the roads, we installed filters packed with hair in the catch basin inflows, a lesson we learned from the Deepwater Horizon disaster, where they, spread, where they spread hair on the beaches to absorb the oil. In 2005, I got a $400,000 stimulus grant to improve energy efficiency in the seven buildings in Memorial Park, the centerpiece of the island. We tightened the envelopes using spray foam wherever possible, installed smart thermostats, switched to LED lighting with occupancy sensors, and educate empl ed educated employees about best practices. The biggest component of the project was a 50-ton geothermal system that serves the library and city hall and reduced energy consum consumption by 42%. Since localizing food production is a, is a sustainable practice, we set up an organic community garden that has never used any city water. All the buildings surrounding the garden have rain barrels, and we capture the condensate off the air conditioners from the Y and the, and the uh, gym, and that produces about 400 gallons of fresh water every day. In 2007, Georgia Tech and Southern Company projected, excuse me, collaborated on a project called Southern Winds to assess the offshore wind potential for the coasts of Georgia, South Carolina, and Eastern Florida. The study found that the best wind resource in the region is roughly 10 nautical miles off Tybee, and that a wind farm in that location could provide enough energy to power a third of Georgia. Since a big complaint about offshore wind farms is the visual impact, they, they created a simulation of five, five megawatt turbines off Tybee, showing that they're less visible than the existing buoys that mark the shipping channel. If, if you can see them, you're doing well, there they are. Um, and there, it's essentially, if you're standing on the beach and you, it, those turbines are gonna have about the same impact as your thumbnail at the end of your arm, if it's outstretched. Those five turbines, if built, would provide enough electricity for the entire island of Tybee. 
In 2010, I organized an island-wide Hands Across the Sand event to raise awareness of the environmental dangers of offshore drilling and promote renewable energy. We had 1,400 residents and tourists joining hands to create a human boom along the beach to illustrate our opposition to extracting oil off our shoreline. If you notice, <clears throat> if you notice the date, if you can read that, if you notice the date, those of you with geodetic memories will realize this event was held a month before the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Y'all didn't know this was going to be a shirt show, did you? In 2010, to show I practice what I preach, I installed a five and a half kilowatt solar system on my house, one of the first on the island. I also had a blower door test done and with about $50 worth of spray foam, caulk and baby plugs reduced by base load 30%. So I haven't had an electric bill in 12 years. In 2012, I got a $98,000 Georgia Sea Grant to develop the first municipal climate change adaptation plan in the country. Working with DNR, we developed a revolutionary herringbone design for sand fencing that has greatly increased the rate at which dunes are accreting, and that system is being replicated along the coast. In the southwest quadrant of the island, which had chronic flooding issues, we replaced one 36-inch storm sewer with two 48-inch pipes that added tide gates to the outflows. The gates act like scuppers on a boat. They close when the tide starts coming in. So instead of being full of seawater at high tide, the sewer pipes have the capacity to contain a lot of rain before the tide goes out. We used mesh bags of oyster shells to create living shorelines along the marsh, stabilizing the banks and adding an extra level of filtration for stormwater. One of these projects was sited so that it catches nine out of 11 stormwater outflows. And since one mature oyster filters 50 gallons of water a day, this now fully established reef significantly improves water quality. In 2015, working with a group of volunteers, we implemented the first Solarize program in the Southeast. Solarize is supported by the Department of Energy and is essentially a way to reduce the cost of rooftop solar by buying in bulk. We set out an RFP stipulating what kind of systems we wanted, what we expected in terms of installation, warranty, and service, and that all bidders include a tiered pricing structure reducing the cost per watt based upon total kilowatts installed. Over 600 people signed up for site assessments, and of those, 67 signed contracts totaling over 300 kilowatts, which reduced the price for everyone from $3 a watt to $2.70, less than half what I had paid five years before. The Solarized Tybee program tripled the amount of rooftop solar countywide. I'm very grateful that we've been able to accomplish as much as we have on Tybee in spite of challenges based upon economics, political differences, and rampant ignorance and or denial of the reality of climate change. We've come a long way, but there's a lot farther to go and we're running out of time. And that's my time. <laughs> Back at you. Hey, Paul, thanks. That was great, man. Um, First off, tell everybody where you are in that lovely backdrop. Oh, I, I am in my second home, which has become my first home accidentally. I've, I've inadvertently created a full-time job for myself by starting to rent golf carts on a little island called Defusky, which is right across the river from Savannah, about seven miles as the crow flies, um, and it's only accessible by boat. So uh, golf carts are a booming industry here. I got in just in time. Uh, ironically, the pandemic tripled tourism on Defusky because this is the kind of place people are looking for. It's four times bigger than Tybee with 300 full-time residents. Still mostly woods. Speaking of Muir, it's mostly woods, a lot of wildlife, shorebirds, um, dirt roads with live oak canopies, uh, three miles of really nice beach. Um, so, so this is kind of where I live now. This is my back porch where I sleep. <laughs> and um, you can just commute back and forth across the what is it, Calabog Sound or whatever. Yeah, well, I come across the Savannah. If it's not too rough, I come out across the shipping channel from from Tybee, and I could drop my boat in the water and be at my dock on Defusky in 30 minutes. Uh, the option is driving is taking a ferry that takes like an hour. I'm I'm willing. But, yeah, to pretty good lifestyle. Our, uh, listeners today uh, have such a lovely backdrop as you. I know I don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is my this is know, my office. One of the things that you and I have, uh, you and I have talked about this a lot. Um, you're in Georgia. 
you're in the deep south, you're in red state Georgia. Um, how is how how do you a what what is the impression? What do, what do folks think about climate change? And then b how do you get them to act? Um, the, the general consensus I think is evolving. I think based upon recent events. Uh, nationally and globally, people are starting to wake up finally where you know, they don't have to be slapped in the head anymore the way I used to have to do. I, I was a voice crying in the wilderness for 20 years, but um, in, in fact, our mayor, who was a, a semi-reasonable Republican, um, used to ask me why Tybee was doing all this stuff when nobody else was. And, and my response would be, invariably be, well, because we're on the front lines and we're going to be the first ones underwater. If we don't do it, who will? So uh, what I learned by trial, trial and error, excuse me, is um, when dealing with conservatives, Republicans, I'm a screaming liberal, but I'm a fiscal conservative, and I know how to talk economics. The things that I have done either create jobs, reduce expenses, lower taxes, or some combination thereof, and, and that's how I've been able to get stuff through the state legislature, um, rarely through the Congress. But um, I'm dealing with people who at first were saying climate change isn't real, it's a hoax, and, and are now, I think, finally, as I say, waking up to the reality. Yeah, I, I think and that dovetails pretty much with the way I understand things going on, too. And I remember even five, six years ago, I'd go down there and I'd talk to, oh, you know, uh, Camden, um, other county officials, city officials, and, you know, to, to a man, and they were mostly men, you know, they were pretty conservative. And I'd say, but you guys are doing stuff like, you know, and it, it, you're raising sidewalks. You're, um, you know, you're, you're keep making electrical systems uh, immune to sea level rise. You're having, putting in building codes that say you must be another three feet off the ground. So they're doing stuff. And I go, well, how do you square that? You know, all these climate related, sea level rise related actions with you know your disbelief in climate change and again to a man they'd all say you know i don't know where this stuff is coming from they do but they don't want to say it um but i would be derelict in my duty as a city manager a public official a county official uh, if i did not you know combat you know and take into account that the the seas are rising you know, they'd, they'd vote me out of office or they'd, they'd fire me. So I thought it was interesting, that sort of dichotomy between, you know, what they, you know, publicly say and what they actually do. Yeah, it's the same for us. A lot of people became believers when their backyard started being underwater every high tide. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing I tried to do early and didn't get done until a couple of years ago is um, I contacted FEMA and asked if there wasn't some kind of proactive thing we could get some kind of grant money we could get to elevate houses out of the floodplain mm -hmm. um, the, the director for the southeast whose name escapes me um, said there was such a program but it was very onerous to get into so after Matthew and Irma um, they finally allocated I think it was 10 million dollars statewide mm -hmm. and there were only two communities that applied for the money we were right. one we were, in the, we were at the foot of the line and I think we got mm -hmm all if not almost all of it so we had a, a pretty rigorous program where all the people who had had flooding were willing to maintain flood insurance on their properties and pay the difference in elevating them um mm -hmm. would qualify for one of these grants and i think we've had about a dozen houses lifted so far and another hundred or so in the queue so mm -hmm. and that's a big i mean and another thing i mean we we get a 25 per di di percent discount on our flood insurance premiums because we've been proactive in doing stuff like this. Uh, right. yeah, good so yeah. well, even, and I know you know my friend Melissa. Uh, yeah. About that. She, for, for y'all out there, she's an old colleague of mine, moved, retired on Tybee, was smacked by a hurricane in 20, I can't remember which one, oh, it was the one I was out there for. Yeah, Matthew, um, I think was 10, maybe. Matthew, 45. right? Yeah. Yeah. So got, her house got demolished, but Matthew, she rebuilt, Year later, another hurricane came through, demolished her house, she rebuilt, but now it's 10 foot off the ground. Yep. And I'm like, why do you keep doing this? You know, she goes, well, this is where I live and this is where I love and I'm gonna stick around. And um, I, there's, there's an interesting uh, study that I quote in the book and it's out of uh, Australia University. And I'm sure there's probably similar ones here done in the States by now. But um, the further you are from the coast, a coastline, 
the less you believe in climate change. And so what that you know, it says to me is that if you live it every day, if you see the seas rising, if you see those hurricanes coming ashore and smacking you, if you see as the picture of Highway 80 there showed even sunny day flooding, you know, king tides and all that, making it impassable to get off, you know, to go to work or school, um, then you're gonna believe it more. You come further inland where, yeah, it's hot, yeah, we get storms, you believe it less. And I think, you know, for us, public policy people, you know, that we've got to sort of change that, you know, that equation, that understanding. Yeah, and in fact, one of the things that hit me in the face, when we did our climate change adaptation plan, it was run by um, a department at the University of Georgia. Jason Evans was our project manager, really good guy who has since left Georgia because, yes. because in part, while we were doing this, the Board of Regents forbade anyone who worked for the university for using the terms climate change right. in conjunction with sea lords. They just said, you can't talk about it. And we were doing this stuff. I mean, we're, and he's gotten to be, a, I think, a very, very well read expert on projections and doing the math on all this stuff. He's now at Stetson University in Deland, Florida with tenure. Um, yeah. and, and he has been a really good resource for a lot of different communities trying to deal with this stuff. I wonder if, um, you know, you guys have been doing climate stuff on Tybee for more than 10 years, right? Yes, easily. And, you know, can you say with any certainty that it's working? I mean, the seas are still rising, the storms are getting worse, but what do you look at that says, yeah, we think, uh, you know, we think it's doing good? Well, um, there are more buildings that meet the code, that meet FEMA code. Um, the sand dunes are much healthier. We, we have been working on sand dune building for, um, well, they've really been doing it for 50 years. As, as I mentioned, we've created a new design for the sand fence that does a much better job of capturing what's out there blowing in the wind, so to speak. Um, the, the lines of dune fields, the rows between um, the houses and the water line are much healthier, much deeper and taller. That's our first defense against any sort of storm surge and, and even just um, king tides. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's a very visible impact. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention is part of our adaptation plan was raising all the lift stations for our sewer system, for the sanitary sewer and adding generators to those. So if the power is out from a hurricane, at least we can use the bathrooms <laughs> without having them back up. That was a biggie, that was a tough sell because it cost about $200,000 a piece to do those and there were seven of them. Um, that's the kind of thing, if you ride around the island, which we did, um, you can see that kind of thing, and, and it's definitely a visible impact of, of what we have done, thankfully, with state and federal money, mostly. And then um, where do you come down, and this is, you know, the million or 10 million or 50 million dollar question these days, on beach renourishment. Uh, you guys have had it, you know, every community is going to get it more and more. Um, what's your thoughts on, is it good money after bad or is it a necessity? Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those situations where if you don't spend the money now, you're going to spend a lot more later. Um, we have a beach renourishment scheduled every seven years and, and we are more fortunate than most on Tybee. Hilton Head, Defusky um, are all on their own for their beach renourishments in terms of, of paying for that. We get roughly 60% of ours paid for by the federal government because uh, the Corps of Engineers has done studies showing that, that the, the beach quality sand that would normally be accreting on Tybee through the littoral drift north to south along the eastern seaboard is falling into the shipping channel and then they're pumping it 10 miles offshore instead of letting us use it for renourishment. Um, so it's, it's, but it's still a lot of money. I mean, it still costs the city three or four million dollars every seven years, the feds kick in another 10 or 12 or 13 million every seven years. But if we didn't do that, we'd be replacing homes on the beachfront. There are houses, I, I used pictures of um, houses on Defusky aptly named the Driftwood Cottages, which have become such, um, that were built so close to the beach that now every tide high, every high tide, the water's coming up under them. The sewer, the, the water and sewer lines are exposed. Um, they're they've all been condemned and these were multi-million dollar houses it's, it's like if 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 we don't renourish that kind of thing is going to happen whether or not you think people who can afford a million dollar house on the beach deserve um state and federal money remains to be seen but uh 
as well, I say, definitely. you know, the beach renourishment is my money. The million dollar house is their money. And if they're, oh, how do I choose my words carefully? Foolish enough to rebuild <laughs> on a uh, dynamic dune system with seas ever encroaching. Well, that's that, that should be their risk. But I yeah, think we're well, also yeah. all, we're, we're all familiar with, uh, you know, just a couple of months back, the pictures of the houses on the Outer Banks that those two houses that just went under during um, I don't even know if it was a bad storm or not, but well, anyway, this is good stuff, man. Um, I hope and think and believe that there are some folks who have some questions. Michael, if you want to read them out or whatever. Sure, absolutely. Um, and uh, we've got a number of comments as well, so I'll, I'll read those and you can respond to them. Just the good one, ones, please. Yeah, just the good ones. <laughs> Well, we'll share everything with uh, both uh, Dan and Paul. So anything that gets sent will be shared, even if we don't share it online here today. And thanks everybody for being here. And you can continue to add questions here and we'll go for maybe another uh, 20 minutes or so with questions. Um, I guess one, one um, we got a couple of them in regards to kind of the historical context. And Dan, I don't know if you can answer these, but I guess one question would be kind of the, the relevant time frame of uh, John Muir's travels relative to the Civil War. I believe he actually walked through the region after the war. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, he um, maybe I was a bit confusing. When he was at the University of Wisconsin, it was um, 1861 to then he went up to Canada. He came back, uh, I think, probably 1865 as the war was winding down. He began his trek and his trek took place in 1867 which the war was over, obviously, but as you all know, Reconstruction was, you know, well underway here and it was still, you know, militarized in places, terribly poor, um, just a not friendly, welcoming environment. Understood. I guess another uh, historic question here, and I don't know if you can answer this, but if you can, um, we got a couple of, along these lines, and this one is from Alan Oberst, who says, it's intriguing to me that one of the other major figures in the formation of the National Park Service, Frederick Law Olmsted, also made a major trek through the South. He reported his journey in serial form in the New York Times before the Civil War. Is there any evidence that John Muir was familiar with that or that it had any influence on him? And what is your thought on both of those journeys and the accounts that they wrote? That's a good question. Um, he was, I don't know whether they met. Again, I'm not a Muir scholar. I've read as much as I can. I don't know whether they physically met, but they were familiar with each other. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny, a lot of the towns that at the time Muir walked through, Louisville, for example, there are wonderful Olmstead parks there. Um, and, you know, obviously those, those two guys were kindred spirits in that, you know, we need, you know, whether it's on top of a mountain in the uh, high Sierra or whether it's a park in downtown Louisville or suburban Louisville, we need these green spaces. Um, so I don't, again, I don't know whether or not they were uh, intimates, but I do know that each shared pretty much the same sort of, you know, as far as Muir went in an urban uh, out, uh, naturalist philosophy, they were kindred spirits. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question here is from Linda Hikachi, who asks, um, in your journey, did you find a town or a place that you just fell in love with and would like to visit again or recommend that others visit? And what was the favorite and least favorite part of your journey and this project? Oh, God. Well, I'm not going to tell you my favorite places because then you'll come visit and they won't be, you know, special anymore. Um, but, yeah, there are, uh, I mean, I, uh, for, I have a... Uh, a love-hate relationship with Florida. I do a lot of work down there. It has incredible beauty, incredible biodiversity, but it really makes me sad just the level of overdevelopment and you know just greed going on. And I mentioned, um, you know, they last year there was this push for three brand new toll roads, mostly going through the northern section of the peninsula the, of the state, up through the Panhandle. And, you know, virtually 80, 90 percent of the residents when they were polled, and these are rural conservative folks, a lot of farmers, ranchers, didn't want them. Um, so last year they killed, you know, before it even got to the governor's desk, they killed, which was really encouraging, I thought, 
these routes. Well, lo and behold, a bad idea never stays down long in Florida. One of those roads is, is back on the table and getting a lot of attention. And it would run right across, smack dab across the Big Bend area, which is the curve uh, along the Gulf where the peninsula and the panhandle come together. It's really wild. Um, few towns, a lot of agriculture, Suwannee River, um, all sorts of wonderful wildlife refuges, state national parks, um, just wild and beautiful and really sort of the last corner of Florida that's left. But now they're back again because they want to put a toll road through there and still the opposition is just as strong. So that really sort of breaks my heart. Um, and one of my favorite towns uh, is there and it's where John Muir ended up. It's called Cedar Key. And it's right below where the Suwannee River, the wonderful Suwannee River lets out into the Gulf. And one of the beauties of this Big Bend area, unlike you know most of Peninsula and the Gulf of Florida, it's that it's very shallow. And so the, the shallowness means that you know John Q. Developer cannot come in there and put in a uh, 800 boat marina and 1600 condos and whatnot. So it has not been developed to the extent that the rest of Florida has. Um, so Cedar Key is just, a, it's an old fishing village um, and it's still largely as charming as it was 50, 100 years ago, even when John Muir was there. It's becoming a bit touristy, of course, but it's not overdone. So that would be one of my favorite places. Um, I think also, uh, I mean, there's Asheville, of course, there's Savannah, places that people know as bigger cities. But another one of my favorite places, which I went to in the book, even though it wasn't on John Muir's route, is up around the Big Bend is Apalachicola, which is a town also on the Gulf that where the Chattahoochee River lets out. And I've been there a hundred times reporting and my family goes down there every summer for a vacation because again, the town itself is a lovely little old oystering village um, with a brewery now and just lovely along the river there. And it's just a short hop skip and a couple of uh, bridges out to St. George Island, which is like some of the beaches, you know, still undeveloped that I, um, uh, grew up loving. Uh, towns that kind of broke my heart, Kingston, Tennessee, um, which at first I'm like, man, this is beautiful. It's uh, hilly up in northern central Tennessee, uh, Cumberland Plateau. You can see the Blue Ridge in the distance. Uh, I was tooling around there, feeling, you know, following John Muir's route in a good mood. And uh, there was a festival, a John Muir festival of all things going on. I'm like, I'm in heaven. And then I got to talking to people and they go, well, you know what those smokestacks over there are about, don't you? And that was the scene of the worst coal ash spill uh, in the nation's history and one of the worst spills in the nation's history. And so I spent a lot of time there talking to people, uh, victims of the coal ash spill, the guys who went in there to clean it up, many of who have died. Um, the local, the Knoxville paper puts the number of dead at 50 from complications from cleaning up the coal ash. Um, and so I just interviewed a bunch of folks who are dying basically and got their stories. So I kind of a rambling answer, but I hope that answers a couple of your questions. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Um, here's one from uh, Michael Burrill who is saying he has a, actually he identifies it as a selfish question in that he says, I'm working on a recreation plan for a rural Tennessee County nor near Murphy, North Carolina. It was undoubtedly a, along Muir's route and also encompasses one end of the Benton Mackey Trail. Other than your book, where would you point me for more information about these two foundational conservationist personalities and their work in this region? And what elements of their work do you think would most resonate with our current rural residents? I assume he's referring to Muir and Benton Mackay. Uh, Benton Mackay was uh, if not the, uh, the founder of the Appalachian Trail, he was one of the main guys who, who created it. Um, and there's, I prefer actually these days, the Benton Mackay Trail because the AT is just too crowded. Um, and further, and not to belabor the point, but I like to do a lot of backpacking, but I do not go to the Smokies until February when I have it all to myself because it's just too crowded. It's the most crowded national park in the country, 14 million people. And it's got some real issues in backlog of maintenance and you know deteriorating conditions. I applaud you for putting together a park uh, near Murphy. Uh, you probably know where Coker Creek is. 
<laughs> excuse me, Muir crossed over that. Um, and there's also, you probably also know, um, I believe it's along the, oh, which river? It's not the, da, 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 I forget, but there's a John Muir Trail that runs up along one of the rivers there, which initially, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, did John really walk up this trail along this river to get into North Carolina? <clears throat> Excuse me, and I pretty much figured out, no, he didn't. Because, you know, later all these rivers were dammed and everything, so the whole topography changed. And I figured he probably took the old uh, Indian trading trail that went over from Coker Creek on down into, uh, through Cherokee lands and then eventually over to Augusta, Georgia. Um, so anyways, I, you know, like the folks and look into, um, you know, what the folks did up in Kingston, uh, Tennessee, which is not too far from you, maybe a hundred miles when they were, they had, um, excuse me, two Muir festivals in like 19 and 2020. And uh, they kind of failed because they didn't get enough um, publicity and enough people, but it was music, it was crafts, there was a sturgeon release. So I think, you know, if somebody could resurrect that and link it to Muir, just link it to outdoor recreation, uh, I think that would be wonderful. And especially in your area, which I'm assuming is kind of the, probably the Cherokee forest, um, beautiful there, you know, a lot of good white water, a lot of um, just good, great outdoor activities. So um, let me know when it is and I'll, I'll come over and visit. Okay, if they answer, I will let you know. Um, here's a question for Paul. Um, since you're a fiscal, fiscal conservative who emphasizes job growth and creation along with ecological conservation, what are some of the replicable, replicable programs that we could initiate in other parts of, of the South like you did in Taipei? Hey, a, a no-brainer would be a solarized program if you haven't done that yet. Um, it it uh, definitely got some people awake about the potential benefits or the actual benefits of, of rooftop solar, that it's not cost prohibitive the way it used to be, um, especially with a solarized program where you're getting people doing competitive bids to lower the price. Uh, that's something that any community can benefit from. I think we, we were unusual in that the city is the one that sponsored this. Typically it's done by a nonprofit, but um, that's something that, that could really be good. Um, in terms of, uh, and that's, you're, you're creating jobs there by um, obviously buying solar panels, hopefully uh, domestic panels, and, um, and you're having people to install them locally and maintain them locally, although they don't require much maintenance. Uh, promoting wind farms, whether they're on or offshore, uh, is a big job creator. And, and I'm still at your know, Block Island, as far as I know, is still the only offshore wind farm in the States. And I, I went to a, a conference. I was invited to speak at a, a wind conference in Massachusetts years ago. And the city manager or administrator from Block Island was there. And he said they were providing all their electricity at the time with with diesel generators. So for them, you know, offshore wind wasn't expensive and they're actually um, exporting power to the mainland from their wind turbines on Block Island. Um, but that that's a burgeoning industry worldwide and it's gonna create a lot of jobs and they do require maintenance. So um, any kind of wind turbine uh, that you can install, um, you have to cut the arguments that they're gonna kill birds. You, these have to be sighted properly. Um, the, the studies that I've seen show that migratory birds will within 30 days alter their flight paths to go around them. Um, they're not quite as deadly as you think, but you know, you, you kill one golden eagle and it's all over. So, so that, you know, there, there are hazards involved. Um, any kind of green building is good and, and will create jobs for people who want to do the right thing, doing land, uh, re replacing um, typical stormwater systems with swales, rain gardens, that kind of stuff, especially on, along the coast, there's a lot of opportunity for that kind of thing. Um, and, and I should have more things at the tip of my head, but I don't, I'm sorry. That's, that's all I can think of right now. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, we got a question. Uh, Dan, uh, asking, you just were alluding to a portion of, I believe, a designated Muir Trail. Are there other um, elements of trails that are being planned for or under development or being thought of that don't exist that are uh, kind of within this area that you've uh, traveled? Uh, the short answer is under development, no, not that I know of. Uh, and it's kind of sad, really, um, because, again, I think, you know, Muir is, again, one of these iconic 
Americans who had such an impact on the country. There, you know, it was kind of funny when in Southern Kentucky, there's a highway <clears throat> that Muir at the time, it was a farm to market path, walked for about, oh, 50, 60 miles. I can't remember what the, the state highway number is, but back in the early aughts, uh, some, you know, sort of smart local chamber of commerce types said, hey, we need to turn this into the new John Muir Memorial Highway. And, you know, we'll get a lot of tourists down here and our dying towns will flourish. Um, so they did that. They got a proclamation through the uh, Kentucky legislature. They put up, you know, a series of signs saying this is the John Muir Highway and everything. And it's still there, but it's, you know, it's still just as rural and actually nice and calm as it was before. You know, scattered here and about, there are markers to John Muir. John Muir walked through here. Um, there's a move afoot, and, it, and it's been a footing for, gosh, about eight years now to put up a, a marker in Bonaventure Cemetery, which, again, if y'all have not been there, I would definitely check out um, Savannah and check out the cemetery. <clears throat> it's being the local Sierra Club has been trying to do this for years, and I think the city has just said, nah, we don't want y'all to do it. There is in uh, outside of... Um, Jacksonville and Amelia Island, Florida, there is, and I, I you know, about uh, passed it while I was zipping by in my car, a John Muir Ecological Park, which, you know, of course, I went back and checked it out. It kind of freaked me out. It's a small one acre off the busy hot six lane uh, divided highway um, park boardwalk going back into the, uh, the forest, into the, the, the swamp, basically. And there's a couple of placards in there saying, who is John Muir? And this is the route he took and everything. And it, you know, if you let your imagination run wild, you really get a sense of what John had to um, put up with to walk across. Again, 1867 Florida was not developed and he largely followed the path of, path of a railroad. Um, but on either side of that railroad was just largely saw palmetto and oak trees and swamps and a few alligators and whatnot. So I, I think, and to me, it's sort of disappointing that there is not more of a recognition, and I think there should be, obviously. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and thanks, everybody, for submitting questions. Uh, you can continue to submit them, and we'll ask a couple more before we wrap up here. Um, next one here is from Janice Eberance, who notes that I believe she works and lives in West Point, Kentucky, which sits on the Ohio River just south of Louisville. Uh, we currently have an RTCA grant with the National Park Service to investigate possible new hike, paddle, and horse trails in natural settings in the vicinity of Muir's uh, walk from Louisville to Cedar Key, Florida. Uh, we got our grant before the pandemic, which and then the process has lost a lot of steam, and we're trying to get back on track. Um, they she said she'd like to contact you to discuss the trail with others along uh, the trail or close to Muir's route or those with good info on where natural land still exist, which may be linked to create a green ribbon south. Um, and she also notes that they have smokestacks just miles away as you're currently discussing. Um, so for is issues and efforts like that, um, how do you see um, folks coming together and are there other resources available to support that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of resources out there. And actually, you know, just south of Louisville, there's a couple of organizations. Um, and I'm sure she knows who this is. There's a lovely uh, bio preserve, a family name or whatnot, you know, a couple thousand acres. And I thought already there was an effort afoot to make a greenway from, say, oh, and I'm looking at my map here, Elizabethtown up to um, Louisville and then over to the Ohio River. Because um, you've also got Fort Knox there and I think they would be um, amenable to, um, to, to joining any sort of greenway because now you have, and, and I'll, I'll shoot the acronym at you and you know, write it down, <coughs> REPI, R-E-P-I. Um, one of sort of the unsung stories and frankly, you know, really good works are being done in the South when it comes to conservation revolve around military bases. Not only uh, conservation work 
that is being done on base, um, muscle restoration, fish habitat restoration, what have you, but also on the areas surrounding military bases. And the thinking there is that as you know, communities, cities sprawl further and further, they're gonna get in the wheelhouse of these military bases. And I don't know necessarily if Fort Knox is a good example of this, but you know, down here in the deeper South, we have huge military bases, whether for the Air Force or the Army and the Marines, and they all want buffers outside of their gates. They want buffers around there so that they, continue, they can continue their training mission. Um, so my, the feds, Fish and Wildlife, USDA, and others work closely in states and nonprofits work very closely with uh, the Defense Department, which has more money than all of us combined, so keep that in mind. And they are now, and they are required by law to do good conservation work, which for them means buffering outside of their gates, buying up lands, not just easements, conservation easements, but buying up lands around their bases so that you know, a subdivision guy living in a subdivision can't call up his local congressman in five years and say, hey, you know, the planes are too loud. I don't want them there anymore. Um, this, this is a way to sort of, you know, put a, um, a buffer again between sprawl that's coming and uh, the, their mission. So I would, I bet my bottom dollar that, um, you know, Fort Knox probably has, I know they have, they have um, biologists on staff and I'm sure if you were to go and say, hey, who's your REPI, R-E-P-I officer, if they don't have one, they can find one. But I think they'd be an invaluable partner. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, here's one from Keegan Barris, who asks, I recently saw on the news that some national parks are requiring reservations. Uh, what do you think John Muir would think about this? And what are your thoughts about this approach to addressing overcrowding during peak season? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. But I think John Muir would, you know, first and foremost, he would be just astounded at how crowded um, not just the parks are, but the country is. You know, again, 150 years ago, he could walk for days without seeing anybody. Now, you know, I can't walk down the street without seeing you know, 200 neighbors. Um, I would, I think that he would, maybe I would share the similar sort of philosophy. I take the Smokies because I'm most familiar with them. They're near me and they're the most crowded park, but it's a similar situation, whether you're at Yosemite or Yellowstone or whatnot. There's too many people. Um, it really ruins the enjoyment, I think, to go out there and have to spend 45 minutes circling to get a parking spot. Uh, what I hate, again, is, you know, backpacking and want to get out in the middle of nowhere and all the shelters are, are filled up, you know, the trails are starting to crumble. Um, I take a tent anyways because I don't want to be at a shelter with people. Um, but it's really, you know, the AT in particular is just, you know, between April and November now is just like a constant, you know, traffic. So although I, you know, I, I think it's sort of a sad state of affairs we've gotten ourselves into that we're going to have to start taking reservations for parking spots and for um, camping spots. I really don't see any other way around it because, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's just, you know, I suppose one of the beauties of the pandemic and of society in general now is that people are, you know, really discovering and we've got a really a larger constituency for things conservation in the wild, in the wild ones. Um, but comes with that, you know, overcrowding and all the problems too. So I don't like it, but I think it's uh, inevitable and I think it's something we have to consider. Great, thanks, Dan. Well, looking where we are on the clock, we're almost at 2.30. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody for submitting all the questions. We will share everything, all the comments and questions with Dan and Paul. Uh, but I did wanna give each of you, I guess, a chance to give us some closing thoughts and takeaways uh, based on what you were talking about today and, and what we can do, I guess, as, as follow-ups to what you are saying. We'll, we'll start with Paul. Um, well, if I could leave you with any kind of thought, it's that um, if you're frustrated and feeling helpless and as if you can't make a difference, you can just by modifying your behavior, if necessary, as an individual. For instance, one thing that pisses the hell out of me is plastic water bottles. This is a stainless steel cup with a stainless steel, stainless steel straw, and I'll be in the landfill before this is. It's going to last forever. 
Um, and if you don't trust your tap water, filter it. Uh, you don't need to be buying plastic water bottles. 90% of those bottles don't end up getting recycled. It, it, they're never going to go away. They're going to become microplastics and end up in the oceans. So that, that's something. So things like that. You know, when you leave a room, turn off the lights. Uh, do whatever you can to to minimize your impact in terms of energy use. Um, what you drive, Dan, I'm still a little concerned about your carbon footprint. But uh, what are you going to do? Um, just, just try to think of before you do anything, um, ask, is it going to, is there a better way I can do it? Reduce, reuse, recycle in that order. Uh, try to try to use less stuff. If you need something that you don't have, see if you can find it used. Um, and, and for God's sake, if you have to buy something new when it's it, at the end of its useful life, recycle it. Um, somebody else. But um, that's the kind of just, just don't be frustrated by the fact that a lot of people don't get it. it as long as you do, you'll be making a difference. Just just live the life you know to live and, um, and you will have an impact. Good advice, man. I second all of that. Um, again, I know I've been accused by some of being sort of a downer and depressing in my book, um, but I do, I am an optimist, believe it or not, uh, given what's going on in Washington and with the climate. And I, you know, it's as Paul said, it's incumbent upon all of us to do what we can, how we can, to you know, save Mother Earth. I think you guys, and again, I'm I'm a fan of city county planners, um, you know, the people who are in the trenches doing hopefully the good work. Um, I deal with them a lot, both in my reporting job and my day job. Um, and I think you guys probably have as much power as anybody, you know, boots on the ground to say, hey, well. But, you know, let's let's do another acre here of breathing space and less, you know, roadways or let's, you know, put in a park over there or let's figure out a way to um, build up this marsh. And let's, you know, let's do all these ecosystem services stuff, which is just so vitally important. Now, ecosystem, the beauty of ecosystem services is it gives urban dwellers, it gives the nonprofit world and environmentalists a constituency in the urban world, city dwellers who've got nothing to do with the country or the mountains or whatnot. They love to hike, bike, forest bathing, swim, clean water, clean air. All those are ecosystem services. So I'm a big proponent also of pushing those and reminding people of the benefits of ecosystem services. Uh, the do the thing, you gotta vote, give your money to the right people, the right organizations, all those things which may sound trite, but they work. And then finally, I'll leave you with my favorite quote of John Muir's, um, that I tell to everybody, into the forest I go to lose my mind and find my soul. And to me, you know, when I get out in nature and I get out in the trees, man, that's uh, that's my happy spot. So that would be my uh, my parting words of wisdom for you. Great, thank you, Dan. Optimistic tone at the end there. So with that, we're gonna conclude our webinar today, A Road Running Southward, following John Muir's journey through an endangered land. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Dan Chapman and Paul Wolf for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology expert who helps to make this all happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who, of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need the certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including managing the climate crisis, designing and building for floods, heat, drought, and wildfire, which will be held on Tuesday, August 23rd. We wish you all a great day.